Hi there. This is New Testament video 488, 1 Corinthians lesson 7. One more study in chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of study. May this be a profitable time. In the name of Christ Jesus, Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1. The whole chapter, read, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I have baptized also the household of Stephanus, Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Whereas the wise... Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 26 to verse 31. This lesson. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, 
not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Thirty-one verses. It is not a terribly long chapter, but it is loaded and controversial, is it not? This is now our sixth study of First Corinthians chapter 1. Reviewing, recapitulating, restating the prior five lessons. Verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, a sent one, messenger, spokesman of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, the called out group of God, which is at Corinth, southern Greece, the capital of southern Greece, Corinth, to them that are sanctified, set apart, hallowed, made holy in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, set apart ones, holy ones, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Not wrath, not war, but grace and peace to this world for now, not forever. For I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father has completely equipped you in Christ Jesus to overcome sin and ignorance, darkness, blindness, But you Corinthians are defeated. There is spiritual chaos and confusion in Corinth. And it's not God's fault. He has given you by His grace spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings. Not some, all. So, you should think and conduct yourselves according to your resources in Christ. You're not doing that. However, 
you're thinking and acting like you are an atom lost and on your merry way whoosh, to hell. Spiritual stupidity in Corinth. Now, don't chuckle <laughs> or snicker. All around the world, this very second, There are millions of Corinthians in our, quote, Christian homes, churches, schools. Millions upon 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 millions and 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 millions Paul is thankful oh thank God thank God he's gracious to you unworthy undeserving Corinthians or anyone else that Father God would bother to tolerate it at all verse 8 God will confirm you to the end all the way to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Purpose, intent, goal, so you would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You would be without accusation no matter what you do or think. You are still blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. You are secure in Him, not because you've earned it, merited it. If anything, you have not merited it, earned it. It is only because of God's righteousness, His faithfulness, that you are heaven-bound, that you are forgiven, sanctified, redeemed, and so on. You didn't save yourselves from sin and hell, and you certainly can't save yourselves from sin's dominion now. It's already defeated you, conquered you in Corinth. Nine. God is faithful. He's reliable. He's dependable. You are not. By whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Problem in Corinth, number one. Denominationalism, sectarianism. Verse 10. Now I beseech, beg you, ask you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Remember that? Divisions, schismata, schisms. Denominations. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That you would think, that you would live according to sound Bible doctrine. There's the unity. The unity 
is in sound Bible doctrine. Not doing whatever you want, thinking whatever you want. That's why there's no harmony in Corinth. You're doing whatever you want. You're thinking whatever you want. You're your own authority. Like a lost person thinks and acts. Oh no! I'll never submit to God. I'm God. See that? I'm my own authority. I do what I want. I think what I want. You're not going to tell me what I'm supposed to believe. That's the flesh of man. It's called sin. S-I in. Eleven. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you, fights, arguments, disagreements, quarrels. Why? Twelve. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Huh? See? Four cliques. Four denominations. Paul came here first. He gave us the gospel of grace first. But Apollos is more philosophical than eloquent. I'll follow Apollos instead. No! Cephas is my leader. Uh, that's Peter. The Apostle Peter. After all, Peter was with Jesus for three years. Apollos and Paul were The fourth segment in Corinth replies, uh -uh. Those are all men. I don't follow a man. I follow Jesus himself. I follow Christ. His earthly ministry, of course. Thirteen, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus or Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, Paul's gospel. Does not, 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 does not have any relation to water baptism. Our apostle was not commissioned to water baptize. Water baptism is not a part of the dispensation of the grace of God given to Paul, Ephesians 3, 2. Well, hey... Hold on there. Why would Paul be water baptizing anyone then? Hmm. Well, water baptism up to that point had been connected to faith, right? And Israel and the prophetic program 
if Israel's God had changed the dispensations from law to grace, changed apostleships from Peter to Paul, changed agencies from Israel to the body of Christ, how would the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the God of creation, indicate to Israel, I've left you and gone to the Gentiles? Uh, well, maybe he would work through Paul in a manner similar to how he worked through the twelve apostles. Ah, oh, there's the answer. The Acts transitional period and Paul's provoking ministry during Acts is in effect right here at the time of 1 Corinthians. Acts 18 is when Paul went to Corinth on his second apostolic, not missionary, apostolic journey. For a time, Paul did water baptize. Later, he stopped. He received further revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory. Paul, stop it. Don't do it anymore. And he didn't. Now, isn't that simple? You don't have to be a genius. Acts 18, Corinth has a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. So there is Paul next door to the Corinthian synagogue, water baptizing people. See? See that? That's to provoke unbelieving Israel in the synagogue. Simple. Hey, why is our nation's water ceremony with those pagan Gentiles? Because God has left you and gone to the Gentiles through Paul. See? But we have spiritual children in Corinth arguing about people and leaders instead of sound Bible doctrine. And they are attached to people and they have lost sight of what God's word is to us. That would be Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. Philosophers, Jewish traditionalists, denominationalists, are confusing the Corinthians. And instead of following the Apostle Paul, their Apostle, as he follows Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, they are following people. And they are puffed up against each other. They have their clicks, their little groups, Christ is not divided, but you've divided him, you've divided his body, there is no proper thinking in Corinth, no renewed mind, no Romans in Corinth, no book of Romans. Corinthians, you need to get your eyes off of that water baptism. That was temporary anyway. Hey, something else? Leave the wisdom of men alone. 
And now we get into the philosophical portion. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. You can read verses 1 through 4. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That is the cross of Christ of 1 Corinthians 1, 17. I don't preach that gospel of grace, that good news of God's riches at Christ's expense with the wisdom of words, elaborate theological vocabulary that a few understand. I am not trying to manipulate people entice people by using clever human arguments. I don't come as an orator, a speech maker, See, that was common in Greek culture. That was part of their lifestyle as Greeks, the Philosopher's Club. Athens, near to Corinth. Read Acts 17, Athens, the Philosopher's Club. I do not use the wisdom of words. I don't use secular education or worldly words. When preaching the gospel, because that would make the gospel the cross of Christ of none effect, it would nullify Calvary, and instead of the focus being on the cross of Christ, it would be on the wisdom of words. Paul's wisdom, man's wisdom, philosophy, the love of wisdom, philosophy, human wisdom. Eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They have no spiritual understanding and they don't want any. How can a dead Jew save me? I don't believe in an old man living in the sky. I gave up that book of superstition years ago. See? The cross of Christ. That's foolishness to the unbelieving world around us. They think it's stupid. It's silly. Absurd, ridiculous, outlandish. How can we prove scientifically Jesus resurrected? 
<laughs> oh, bless his heart. The scientist, the professor, dear professor, my own professor, who told me that. Why, that was willful ignorance. There are many things we cannot prove in science simply because we have limited understanding. Hmm. First Corinthians one eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. However, the other group of people, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For those on their way to an eternal doom, the lost, the damned of the ages, the preaching of the cross to them is foolishness. But unto us which are saved presently, God saved us, delivered us, rescued us from our sin when we trusted Jesus Christ alone as our personal Savior. That is our state now. Not a process. Justification unto eternal life is not a process unto us which are saved believers it is the power of God power there in Greek is the source of our English term dynamite dunamis We, with spiritual eyes, can see the preaching of the cross in a way the lost cannot. To them it is foolishness. To us who are saved, it is the power of God to deliver us from sin, death, hell, the lake of fire, Nineteen, for it is written Isaiah twenty nine fourteen. It's presently written in a manuscript copy that Paul possesses. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Hey, do you know Corinthians? In the book of Isaiah, Jehovah God, the Lord God, wrote those words. He would destroy the wisdom of the wise. He would bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All that man can fathom using his natural mental faculties. Anything and everything, literally, that sinful man can devise, imagine, plan. I, the Lord God, will bring all of that to nothing. I will frustrate it all. They think they're so smart without me. Who, God? <laughs> we don't need Him. We're the captain of our own faith. We think what we wish, we do as we please. 
We will have our way. See? That is sinful man's attitude toward God. But he is not intimidated and he will not be outsmarted. Watch him work. Verse 20, where is the wise, the philosopher, where is the scribe, the educated man, the scholar, where is the disputer of this world, the debater, the orator, there we are again, speech making, All these intellectuals. These high IQ people. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? They're all fools in his sight. Why? Is not God impressed with their knowledge? How far they've come? How clever their arguments are. They write books. They deliver speeches. They hold seminars. They have their public debates. Don't their degrees, scholarship, all God? <gasps> no. Doesn't God want to just fall at their feet in reverence? No. Twenty-one. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not And pause right there. Knew not. 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 Like a broken record, I repeated. Not. 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 Not, 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 not. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, not. Their wisdom did not lead them to him, his word, his will. Why? Romans 1, the wisdom of this world is the very best that sinful man can devise apart from God's influence. The nations at the Tower of Babel, which would include the Greeks, their ancestors, Genesis 11. When they had a chance to know God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations 
and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1. Mm. See, the Corinthians have forgotten basic grace doctrine in Romans. They are gravitating toward human wisdom. That will give us victorious Christian living. No, it will not. Fools. Romans 1 has already stated the nations are under the devil's control, not God's wisdom. So why are you who are the church of God appealing to the devil's people for insight? See it? It does not make sense. It doesn't. 1 Corinthians 1 21 For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that see and there it is again us which are saved save them see 18 21 it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that what? To save them that figure things out for themselves. No. Do the best they can. No. Memorize philosophy textbooks. No. Hold out. No. Hold on. No. Pray through. No. Turn over a new leaf. No. Recite the sinner's prayer. No. Give alms to the poor. No. Confess their sins, no. Walk the aisle, no. Shake the preacher's hand, no. Repent of their sins and get water baptized, no. See, that's how the world answers. God's pleasure was to save people who would believe. There it is. Believe. Believing. Believing. Believing what? Oh, yes, I believe in God. He's there. Not enough. The devils believe and tremble. James chapter 2. Believing here is soul, heart, faith. Believing God's words to them, which would be what? The preaching of the cross. The cross of Christ. Believing that. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. The gospel of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. God will save them that believe. 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews were fixated on signs, especially miracles. Show us a sign. 
show us a miracle. That was not asked in faith, but unbelief. Because if they did happen to see a miracle or a sign prior, they still didn't believe. <laughs> Study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or early Acts. Well, by the time Paul's ministry is underway, Acts 9 onward, he is preaching to the same apostate Jews of which he was once a part. The Jews, they require those miracles, those signs. We don't want to hear a gospel message, but show us a miracle. <laughs> the Greeks, representing the Gentiles, all Gentiles there, the Greeks, they didn't care about miracles, signs. What they wanted was the wisdom of men. Hey, Give us a logical argument, something we can debate, something we can reason through, figure out using our little puny brains. Now, they wouldn't use the adjectives there I did, but they would definitely exalt Human reasoning. Athens. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Acts 17. They debate Paul there. And they laugh at him too. Foolishness. <laughs> 23, but we preach Christ crucified, whether they want or not. We preach Christ crucified, whether they approve or not. We don't please people. Christ crucified, see, the cross of Christ, 17, the cross, 18. 23, the cross of Christ. Now it's Christ crucified. See? Unto the Jews, verse 23, a stumbling block, a scandal, an occasion to fall, stumble, trip. See? He's not Messiah. He's not Christ. He died in weakness on that cross. He didn't resurrect either. He. And unto the Greeks foolishness. How can a dead man save me? Hmm. How can a death on a cross help me? I don't believe in that. I'm too smart for that. I don't believe in fairy tales. First Corinthians 1 24 Contrary wise, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the power of God, see that, power 18, power 24, and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God to the called Jews, believing Jews, and Christ is the wisdom of God to the called Greeks, believing Greeks. Twenty-five, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
the foolishness of God, the weakness of God? Can God be foolish? Can God be weak? Well, in the eyes of lost people, he is foolish and he is weak. They are incapable of figuring God and His will out. We just don't get it. They have no ability in Adam to comprehend any of this. So what they do is ridicule it. That's the weakness of God. That's the foolishness of God. No, it isn't. It just seems to be God's foolishness and God's weakness. Because God is doing, God is saying what they didn't expect Him to do and say. Ooh. Now, after all of that review, we get to our current study. It is long. There is much reading. A plethora of verses also First Corinthians 1 26 elaboration another four further explanation first Corinthians 1 26 for ye see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty not many noble or call We see our calling. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God called us by Paul's Gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 He invited us to join His plan to glorify His Son, Jesus Christ, in the ages to come. We are also, verse 2, called to be saints. That is our job, that is our role, set apart ones, holy ones. We have a specific role in God's ministry as believers, members of the church, the body of Christ. 26. For ye see your calling, brethren. See, the Corinthian saints are Paul's brethren, as are we. He seeks their spiritual welfare as He does our safety. We should all therefore listen to and believe the Lord's words delivered through Him. There are not many wise men after the flesh called. There are not many mighty call. There are not many noble call. It is noteworthy. It is not not any wise men after the flesh, not any mighty, not any noble, but not many wise men after the flesh, 
Not many mighty, not many noble are called. In God's family, in God's ministry, there aren't many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble. God can save and use and has saved and used through history ordinary, simple, common, average, frail, limited people to accomplish His purpose and plan for the ages. Secular education, nobility, high social standing, superior intellect and physical strength are not prerequisites for justification in Christ or service to Christ. Interestingly, Corinth had both rich and poor, wise and unwise, bond, slave, and free. And the Corinthian church was just as diverse. So they knew exactly what Paul was writing here. For example, Acts 18 in Corinth, Paul's ministry in Corinth. Acts 18.8 Crispus the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house. Verse 17, Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, there's Sosthenes, our brother. So two rulers of the Corinthian synagogue were saved. Crispus and Sosthenes. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14, see Crispus, see Gaius Gaius, Romans 16, look at this, verse 23, Gaius Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. The Gaius or Gaius of Romans 16 likely was, I believe, the Gaius Gaius of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Gaius Gaius was a wealthy man. He hosted the believers. He lodged Paul. Apparently he had a large home. Erastus also in Romans 16, 23, Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. That city was probably Corinth. Erastus had a high-ranking position in the city government. These believers, however, were the exceptions, not the standard. Here is an excellent quote with which we wholeheartedly agree. God did not choose philosophers, nor orators, nor statesmen, nor men of wealth and power and interest in the world to publish the gospel of grace and peace. Amen. 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 We remind ourselves again how the Bible takes a negative view toward man and the world and a positive view toward God. Consequently, we know why the Bible is unpopular with man and the world. 
Keep reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 now. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. There is the foolishness and weakness of God of verse 25. In contradistinction to him selecting the wise, the mighty, the noble of verse 26, he has decided to use, to take and to use that which looks foolish. <laughs> verse 18. Verse 21, verse 23, verse 25, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. That which looks foolish in the eyes of the world. Romans 1, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writing, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, the Greek speakers and the non-Greek speakers, both to the wise and to the unwise, I preach to them all. The scholarly and the unscholarly, the somebodies and the nobodies, the people who have fallen in love with self and education, religion. Oh, they need the cross of Christ too. Because whatever they have, it's not enough to save them from their sin problem. Only Christ. Only First Corinthians one God has chosen the foolish things of the world verse twenty seven there to confound the wise confound put to shame confuse disgrace. Twenty seven and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. See the contrasts all throughout First Corinthians. You have weakness, you have power, you have foolishness, you have wisdom, you have things that are, things that aren't. You have the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. Wisdom of the world and wisdom of God. Well, we have the weak and the mighty. The weak things of the world. God uses them. God chooses them to confound the things which are mighty. Remember in Daniel 2, 19 to 23, that we read in the last study, the scholars of Babylon were unable to make sense of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but there is Daniel, some nobody, in their eyes, that nobody, Daniel, is the Lord's man. And the Lord used Daniel 
to put those wise men, so-called wise men, to shame. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord has a message for you, and He alone can explain it. All the scholarship of the wise men of Babylon was nothing. Couldn't help them. Couldn't help Nebuchadnezzar. See? That'll happen again in chapter 5 of Daniel. And King Belshazzar of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson in Daniel. We'll save that for chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Suffice it to say, Belshazzar receives a message from Jehovah God, and no one can tell him what it means except God's man Daniel. Huh. Deja vu. <laughs> The Lord God used one man, Daniel, to figure out what people could not. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.28 And base things, more contrasts, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are always oh, this humbling, all of it. It comes to a head in verse 29. In contradistinction to God selecting the wise, mighty, noble, verse 28, He chooses the base things of the world base, base there, like basic, basic. It's the opposite of noble, actually, of verse 26, ignoble. <laughs> no nobility, some lowly people there. Not noble, but ignoble. <laughs> no repute, low birth, insignificant. No bodies. God chooses the base things of the world and the things that are despised, 28, despised, branded with contempt, looked down upon, treated as nothing, worthless, trash, in the eyes of the world. First Corinthians 1, 28, yea, an affirmative there. Agreement, strengthening, yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. See? Things which are not things that are. God will use the things which are not to bring to nothing to not things that are. He is selected to use that which looks like it is not as seemingly nothing in the eyes of the world. His purpose was to bring to naught, to destroy things that are. There's more of that foolishness of preaching as an illustration. Remember verse 17 there, Christ sent me 
not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now look at this. 2 Corinthians 10.10 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Paul's detractors in Corinth, people slandering him, and the Corinthians are repeating the insults. Paul physically he looks like nothing. He sounds like nothing. His speech is contemptible. Now what does that mean? It means just what it says. They despise Paul's words. They do not esteem his speech. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things, rude in speech. Now, rude here, remember, In this context, rude does not mean how disrespectful you didn't say, excuse me, that's rude. It's not that kind of rude. There is another definition of rude. This one you will recognize when I tell you a related word is called rudimentary. All oh, the basic. Unlearn it. Idiotes. Rude in speech. Hey, Paul, you sound like an idiot when you talk. Well, you want to say that, that's okay. Why? Because they're listening for the wisdom of words. We're so accustomed to a speech maker with his eloquence here in our Greek civilization. But Paul, you don't come with elaborate sermons. You don't sound like a secular man. There's something wrong with you. Oh, and your bodily presence is weak. They're attacking his character and not listening to the doctrinal content of his message. See, they're using human estimation to judge, discern, evaluate They are the idiots. Eh? Yes. God can use, and did use, these simple words of Paul speaking to accomplish his purpose without college educations, trained speakers, or philosophers. It's humbling. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 For ye see your calling, brethren, 
how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Put them all to shame. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Goal, purpose, intent. Verse 29, that no, and you pause there, no, that no, 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 flesh should glory in his presence. God has arranged it. He's ordained it this way. So no flesh, no person, no man, no woman, no sinner, no one can glory in His presence. What that is, glory there, is boasting or bragging. Look what I did. Look what I am. Look what I have. Uh, no. First Corinthians three twenty one. Therefore, let no man glory in men. That's what the Corinthians were doing. Focused on people. My friend, if I could give you a word of warning, never keep your eyes on people. They will always disappoint you. We have no confidence in the flesh, our own, or anyone else's. What we need to do is have our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. As he is preached in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. The book of 1 Corinthians reaches back into Romans once more. Romans 3.27 Where is boasting then? It is excluded. It's shut out. You are not welcome here. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. You read the context. That is the gospel of grace, what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, not what we do. Look how good I am. I kept this list of rules and regulations. I do the best I can. I make deals with God. I promise not to sin anymore. I kneel at the altar, I've turned from my sin, I've done this, I've done that, but see, it's not enough. So what Almighty God did was make access to Him available only by faith in Christ. You must come through Christ's merits only.
or you will not reach me. And I do it this way to remove forever any opportunity for someone to puff out their little chest. Look what I did to get into heaven. See the nose? I did more than you. No. Anyone, any one who has a right standing before God in human history stands completely, entirely, solely on Christ's finished cross work. That's it. Not church membership, not water baptism, confession of sins, prayers, rites, rituals, ceremonies, scholarship, education, any of it. Romans 4, verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Abraham had to learn it too. He was not justified by works. He was justified by faith in God's words to him. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham, you cannot glory before me either. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace, God's work, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is the gift of God. It's not, not of works. So no man, no one, can boast, brag, glory. It's either faith in Christ or nothing. Move on to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in himself Wrong. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. There it is. No bragging here, except, oh, look how much Jesus Christ did. Look how much he's worth. Humbling, isn't it? The wisdom of men is, look how much I know. I know more than you. I know more than God does. I don't need Him. <laughs> That's glorying in self. And there's a lot of that today. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are the earthen vessels. These frail physical bodies. If the Lord tarries They'll go to the grave and rot.
It's not about us. It's not about people. It's about Christ in us. Christ in people. There it is. There's the mature view. The adult believer. The excellency of the power is of God, not of us. We're just earthen vessels. The treasure in us is Christ, the life of Jesus in us. Keep reading 2 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Father God is working. But of Father God are ye in Christ Jesus. Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Verse 2. In Christ Jesus. You're sanctified in Christ Jesus. Remember? Romans again. You're not in Adam. You're in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with a few spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We lack nothing in Christ. That's our position, identity, the prepositional phrase in Christ, in Christ Jesus. That's where we are, not in Adam, but in Christ. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Romans 8, back to Romans. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Colossians 2.10 And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Complete there means Father God has crammed everything that we need in Christ. And we're in Christ. We can partake of those provisions. The Lord Jesus Christ is all that we truly need. Do we believe that in our soul heart or not? Oh, God, if you would just rain down a financial miracle, a check in the mailbox, a miracle healing from a sick bed, rise up and walk again. Be healed. All that we truly, truly need is in Christ, and we have it now in Christ because of Christ Calvary. So we don't have to worry about, ooh, I hope I perform enough to maintain, to keep those blessings. See? <laughs> That's religion. Holding out, holding on, praying through, hoping, praying. Will I make it? Huh? Huh? 
I hope, I pray, I hope I'm in good standing with the church. Father God has made Christ Jesus to serve us in four capacities which blessings the world cannot offer and will never be able to offer us. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Here are some, here are four spiritual blessings. 1 Corinthians 1.30 but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who, and that's Christ Jesus of God, is made unto us. God has made Christ Jesus unto us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Wisdom. Spiritual discernment. The ability to correctly apply knowledge to specific situations and circumstances. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7. Howbeit we speak wisdom. See? Among them that are perfect, mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. See? What the Holy Ghost is teaching, that's real wisdom. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Ephesians 1.8 Ephesians 1.8 Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Ephesians 5, 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly. Look around as you're walking. Be careful. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will instruct us, are we interested or not? I don't want the wisdom I have in Christ. I want to stay the fool. No. That is all right. And God will hand us over to it if we want. Be careful. Watch out. Remember the Corinthians? Where are they? Acting foolish, aren't they? Not God's fault. Colossians 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 28. Whom we preach, Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect, that is, mature. We impart spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and spiritual understanding as we preach. We do this so believers will grow up. That they think and act like adults, not kindergartners. 
Colossians 2.2 2, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ. Do the heathen philosophers have the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? No, but Christ does. So why do you rever the philosophers? They're not Christ. They don't serve Christ. They don't know Christ. See? The Corinthians are being urged to think critically. Colossians 3.16 let the word of Christ, huh? let the word of man dwell in you richly. Let the word of the church dwell in you richly. Let the word of the denomination, let the word of the theologian, let the word of the church fathers, no. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time, just like in Ephesians 5. Jesus Christ is our wisdom. And when we think of Him, who He is, what He did, and how that affects us, we have the renewed mind of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and Romans 8. Minding the things of the Spirit. The Corinthians need not get entangled with the Greek philosophy that surrounds them. It makes absolutely no sense for them to substitute philosophy for God's Word. For even the world's wisdom is no match for God's wisdom in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 And righteousness, justification, a right standing before God. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, made righteous, declared righteous, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's all Romans again. Righteousness. Romans 3.26 To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, God's righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier, of him which believeth in Jesus. 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified, made righteous, by faith without the deeds of the law. Without, 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 without. Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, not work. Believe, see? Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt, but to him that worketh not, 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 but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See? 24, Romans 4. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, Righteousness, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Corinthians, re relearn Romans, see? 2 Corinthians 5 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Whether positional or practical,
Christ is our righteousness. Romans chapters 1 to 5, remember that? Justification, righteousness, how to have a right standing in God's sight. The Corinthians should not attempt to be decent or upright apart from what Christ is for them and what they have in Him. For all their righteousnesses is but filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Galatians 2.20 See, the Galatians did not learn Romans either. The Galatians, they're the strict, pious, devout, goody-goody legalists. We don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do that, or this. The Corinthians, they were of the opinion, we do everything we want. <laughs> See? So the Corinthians were loose, wild, crazy in their living. That was the flesh, lasciviousness. The Galatians, oh, they used the Bible, they used Moses. That's still the flesh. That's not the Spirit of God either any more than the Corinthians are depending on the Spirit of God. The Galatians, they were stuck on self-righteousness. We're okay. We're all right. We're doing the best we can. We don't need Jesus. And yet they were saved people. And the Corinthians. This is all nonsense. See, it makes no sense at all. The Corinthians and the Galatians have deviated, have forsaken Romans, and they go the way of the flesh. Either they worship men, Corinth, or they worship Moses, Galatia. See? The sins of the flesh, Corinth, the sins of the spirit, Galatia. Galatia is works religion, denominationalism. And, let me remind you, just as you can find many Corinthians in the world, you can find many Galatians too, all over in our churches and schools and homes. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You Galatians are also confused. You think you can live the Christian life too. You're wrong. Righteousness does not come by the law. You didn't learn Romans either. See? Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Paul learned that too. Philippians 3, verse 9. And be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. See? Paul was a goody-goody in religion when he was lost. He knows how absurd that was. I wasn't perfect, though. Oh, I was religious, but not sinless. That's why I needed the Savior, the Savior of sinners, Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 9, and be found in Him, in Him, positional, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Read Philippians 3, Paul's worthless religious resume. Hmm. Not enough before God, I did this, I did that, but God is not impressed with my good works. But he is impressed with Christ's finished cross work, 
which is perfect, perfect righteousness at Calvary. I stopped trusting in self and trusted Christ. Acts 9. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Again. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. Sanctification. Saint. Hallow. Make holy. Being positionally set apart in Christ. And that ought to lead to practical sanctification. See verse 2. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's also chapter 6, 11. Chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Romans 6. You've forgotten Romans. Corinthians. Romans 6. 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. Sanctification. Recall Romans chapter 6 to 8. How our walk should match our wealth in Christ. The Lord Jesus is our sanctification. So the Corinthian saints ought to separate from the sinful conduct of their neighboring heathen Corinthians. Just as God took these believers away from that old identity and lifestyle in Adam, they should reckon it as true. See? That's Romans 6. 6, 7, and 8. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians 1.30 and redemption. Christ has been made unto us redemption. Redemption, the release or deliverance because the purchase price has been paid. Christ is our redemption and he has bought us out of sin's slave market via his shed blood. That's also Romans, but wait. Come over to 1 Corinthians first, chapter 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See? They belong to Him now. Romans 3.24 being justified, huh? See? Righteousness. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption. You've forgotten Romans again, Corinthians. Ephesians 1 7. Ephesians 1 7 in whom in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace redemption Colossians 1 14 in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Titus 2.14 Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us, redemption, from all iniquity, and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He also redeems Israel. Hebrews 9, verse 12, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. The blood of Christ shed on Calvary saves Israel as it does us. 
Israel and the New Covenant in the ages to come. That shed blood of Christ should be the focus of the Corinthians instead of fulfilling the desires of the flesh, sins. Again, the Corinthians need to be reminded of the basic principles of grace as presented in Romans. See? You haven't gotten the basics yet, Corinthians. Oh! You need to go back and relearn Romans. And by him writing these verses, he's reteaching Romans. See? See that? Verse 31. 1 Corinthians 1 31 that purpose goal intent that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord there will be no glorying in God's presence verse 29 in self but there will be glorying in the Lord God will permit that you want to glory, boast, brag? Remember what is written in the Hebrew Bible. Presently, it is written in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. want to find value, worth in something or someone, you find it in the Lord and what He does, not in self and what you do. See, that's humbling. Because the flesh wants to brag. Look what I did. Look what I have. Look what I am. Mm -mm. You want to brag about something? Brag about how you were a pathetic sinner who could not save yourself and you had to trust the Savior to pay for your sins in full because you were helpless and hopeless in yourself. Oh, no boasting in self there, huh? But the boasting in the Lord is, He died for my sins. He was faithful. I am not. He paid the price because I was too poor to pay. Interestingly, all glory. 1 Corinthians 1 will be exclusively in the Lord, the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Jeremiah 9. That's the Jesus Christ of the New Testament here in 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. Ah, the deity of Christ. No boasting or bragging in self. Romans 3, 27. Romans 4, 2. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Galatians 6, 14. Read that one. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The Galatians were glorying in religion, and look what I've done, look what I did. Mm -mm. No boasting, only in the cross of Christ, 
Only in what he did. Only in him. See? Paul quit relying on the law. Hey, Corinthians, you need to stop it. Two. Saul of Tarsus couldn't save himself with the law. Why are you trying? In Galatians. Makes no sense. The Christian servant cannot become proud, prideful. For God never calls the Christian because of fame, fortune, strengths, or wisdom anyway. God has many times used and still oftentimes uses for His purposes those people we would never expect Him to utilize. Remember, God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than our thoughts and our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. When God calls Christians to service, He overlooks qualities that would otherwise disqualify them for service. Their limited education, their bodily weaknesses and physical limitations, their poverty, their timidity, and all such disadvantages. God's choice thus confuses the educated mind that assumed God would not use the ignorant, the disabled, the poor, the shy, and the weak to accomplish His will. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28. It confuses the mighty who assumed God would have chosen them as opposed to the weak He chose. What makes the difference is not the Christian's strengths, but the Almighty God, the Almighty God, who worked in and through him or her, that no flesh should glory in God's presence. Hmm. Humbling again, isn't it? The Lord appeared to Moses and informed him that he will use him to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage. Exodus 4.10, read. <laughs> and Moses said unto the Lord, Hallelujah! No. O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. See, an excuse. Centuries later, the Midianites were persecuting Israel, so God informed Gideon that he would use him to deliver Israel. Gideon argued. Judges 6.15 Judges 6.15 And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Centuries later, the Philistine giant Goliath taunted Israel, but her armies were no match for him. Little David, a lowly shepherd boy, Nevertheless, had faith that the Lord would give him the strength to slay Goliath, which he did using one rock and a sling. 1 Samuel 17, 50. Centuries later, God sent the prophet Jeremiah to warn apostate Israel, but Jeremiah refuted. Jeremiah 1, 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. <laughs> Don't send me. When the Lord Jesus Christ needed apostles to convert Israel, he chose four fishermen, brothers Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and brothers James and John, Mark 1, 16-20. Peter and John are later referred to as unlearned and ignorant men. Acts 4.13 <laughs> The Apostle Paul carried out his ministry with infirmities, sicknesses, weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 12.7-10 Galatians 
Galatians 4.13 If you, dear Christian, doubt that the Lord can use you because of your disabilities, social status, weaknesses, age, or education, just remember Moses' speech impediment, Gideon's poverty, David and Jeremiah's juvenility, Peter and John's ignorance, and Paul's infirmities. <laughs> God used them, people who did not seem like much, for His glory. What made the difference was not their strengths, but the Almighty God who worked in and through them, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Rather than bragging about ourselves and our accomplishments, Paul admonishes us to boast in Jesus Christ, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is the identity that we Christians have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we believe that or not? By the way, for many, many years I had the pleasure of being in ministry with a Christian lady who had a very limited education. She had much difficulty reading and writing, and yet the Lord used her to evangelize almost every one of her family members from the family cult. She's in heaven right now, but there is an illustration of someone weak, ignorant, limited, And yet she was able to share the gospel and win to Christ a great many of her family members trapped in the family religion, the cult. That happened before I was even born. So you know that was a long time ago almost 40 years. We're finished with 1 Corinthians 1. However, I would like to put a supplemental study in this video. I wrote this some years back. Is the God of the Bible anti-intellectual? Back to the wisdom of men. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. One vicious opponent of Christianity voiced his position thusly. Since the Lord God had forbidden Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, knowledge, he must therefore be anti-knowledge. This bygone critic rejected the Bible entirely and vehemently detested Christianity because, as he viewed it, the God of the Judeo-Christian Bible advocates ignorance. 
Interestingly, this celebrity's attitude reinforced Bible ignorance in those he affected and hid Bible knowledge from those he influenced. As always, we must have a pure view of Scripture instead of seeing it distorted through the lenses of denominational eyeglasses. The above individual was raised in a theological system that quotes the Bible only when verses support the church's beliefs. Otherwise, that church is hostile toward the scriptures, ignoring and or ridiculing passages that do not prove useful to advancing that cult's agenda. <laughs> if the Holy Bible ever gets a fair hearing, a rarity, much of what it is presumed, assumed, thought to teach is demonstrated to be false. However, as long as we keep the scriptures divorced from the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry, our willful blindness and abysmal confusion will become a campaign of aggression. Let us study and learn why the forbidden fruit was forbidden. Observe how the Creator originally ordained earthly life to be Genesis 1, 26-28 And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. When the Lord made man, Adam, and woman, Eve, yes, they were real, historical people. He did not create them as robots. They were given volition or free will a capacity to choose what path they would take in life. Since they were creatures and the Lord God was their creator, he exercised the right to make the rules, and he gave them two options. Either they could function as he designed their life to be, Genesis 1, 26-28, or they could deviate from his will, and suffer the dire consequences. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his, into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden, to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then the Lord God made the woman. Satan, the fallen cherub, 
spirit creature in the angelic world, leader of the angelic rebellion against Almighty God, noticed Adam and Eve and realized here was a way to train more worshipers of self. Let us now watch the master deceiver work. The Lord was so gracious in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He gave Adam and Eve an entire garden of trees from which to eat, except one forbidden tree, a fact Satan capitalized on so as to fool Eve into joining his side. In the spirit of modern textual critics, embarking on endless quests to recover alleged lost original Bible readings, never able to overcome their pride and submit to God's preserved and authoritative words in the King James Bible, <laughs> Satan cleverly planted seeds of doubt in Eve's mind and prompted her to reconstruct her own Bible. <laughs> Second Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. We'll come back to Genesis. Second Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4. Paul took Genesis literally. Okay? It's not make-believe, fairy tale, fiction, legend, myth. It's real. It's literal. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, tricked Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Hmm. Corinthians, watch out, be careful. The same serpent that tricked Eve, distracted Eve, fooled Eve, that serpent is with us this exact moment. And really, he's already deceived the Corinthians. He's Satan, the devil. He has been using false teachers in Corinth, lost people in Corinth, to confuse them. They're mixed up. So watch. Eve is a mixed up soul. Read Genesis 3. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. This is not a literal snake. If I were to tell you, so and so is a snake in the grass. Now, remember common sense? Oh, sanctify common sense. If I told you this person is a snake in the grass, bless your heart, my friend. I hope you wouldn't assume, oh, is there a forked tongued scaly, legless creature slithering around? You see, I would hope you would employ some common sense and say, no, 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 that's figurative there. The snake in the grass is somebody who's cunning, who's sneaky, who cannot be trusted. The character of a snake. Well, that's Satan. He's not a literal snake, but he is in character a snake. He's sneaky, he's sly, he's cunning. See? Simple. But the figurative usage of that word snake or serpent does not render the whole passage figurative. Watch. Genesis 3, 1. 
Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? See, a question challenging the word of God. Did God really say this? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat. But what about freely eat? See, Eve does not know what God said. Compare Genesis 2, 16 and 17 with Genesis 3. Eve is not quoting God. She is misquoting God. And Satan uses that to his advantage and to her disadvantage. Genesis 3, 2. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she perverted the word of God there. We'll say more in a moment. Shh. Genesis 3, 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. She added that. God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it. Touching? She added that. Lest ye die, she watered that down. It's thou shalt truly die. See? Eve definitely lacked a clear understanding of God's words to her and Adam. Look at Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. The devil was closer in quoting God than Eve was. Ye shall not surely die. 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ah! Oh. Satan portrayed God as harsh and domineering, thereby causing Eve to believe her Creator and her husband's Creator was not seeking their best interests. That is, Eve, God cheated you and Adam. You both could have been something even better than He made you. And He is limiting you both by having you avoid that forbidden fruit. Let us see if Eve falls into the trap. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. She ate. That's not the worst. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You'll be as gods, knowing good and evil, lowercase g, gods. Of verse 5 there, the fallen angels who had already followed Satan in his rebellion against the one true God, like their leader, they were their own authorities, doing what they wanted. Not only had they firsthand known good, all that God is and does, but they had firsthand known evil too. Life apart from Him. Adam and Eve were tempted into adopting this view as their own. And then they ate. They ate. Like the devil and his angels. Ezekiel 28:18, Matthew 25:41, Revelation 12, 7 and 9. The first two humans would now decide for themselves what is good and what is evil. It had originally been God's sole right to be that judge. Genesis 3.22 
And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, plural, cherub, plural, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Pitiful. All these sinners abandoned God's grace, the identity and provisions He gave them, and preferred to make their own life without Him. As He foretold, disaster would fall. As any sensible parent would discourage his or her child from reading something injurious, seeing something sinful, or doing something harmful, so God erected barriers to guard Adam and Eve against sin for their own good. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He knew the destruction that sin would cause them, and he sternly warned them of it. But he did not force their reaction. They would have their chance to make the right choice, a positive exercise of volition or free will, or the wrong choice, a negative exercise of volition or free will. Regarding church order, the Holy Spirit through Paul commented on those tragic events in the Garden of Eden, and yes, they are literal. 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. According to the Bible, Eve was genuinely deceived, totally unaware of Satan's trap in Genesis chapter 3. Remember? 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. Satan the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety and the wisdom of words. However, Adam knew the danger they were in. He was with Eve. But he did not stop her. And he did not bring her to God either. Instead, he, a terrible spiritual leader example, copied her and ate the forbidden fruit too. Rather than lose Eve and remain loyal to God, Adam made a conscious choice and joined his wife in following Satan. Like all sinners, Satan, Adam and Eve worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, Romans 125. They all wanted to function outside the role the Lord God had given them. Indeed, they all wished to think and experience something besides what the Creator God intended for them. This deification of the creature goes on even now in our civilized, sophisticated, 21st century world. As the name suggests, intellectualism significantly emphasizes the exercise of our human mental faculties. Eventually, we mere finite limited creatures start viewing ourselves as the pinnacle of all knowledge. 
in our minds, we are supreme and independent. Commonly called rationalism, reason and knowledge are exalted at the expense of the supernatural. We begin entertaining foolish thoughts, following the footsteps of Father Adam and Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden. I do not need some God or anything He offers me. I can be good without Him. I will think what I want, and I will do what I want. I can solve my own problems apart from the influence of a higher being. After all, it is my life. And I will make my own decisions because I answer to no one. Ooh, did you hear all of that? Trash talking. These narcissistic attitudes are propagated via millions of prestigious classrooms quote, mental health offices, best-selling books, viral internet videos, and denominational, quote, sanctuaries. Beloved, no wonder our world is overwhelmed with confusion, crime, poverty, war, heartbreak, depression, and various other insurmountable issues. No one reading and believing the Bible could ever conclude it's God promotes ignorance. Actually, carefully consider the existence of the Bible itself. Has it not been given to teach us God's will? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, teaching, training, education in righteousness that the men of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Moreover, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul wrote about six areas of truth of which we should not be ignorant. Romans 1, 13, Romans 11, 25, 1 Corinthians 10, 1, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, 2 Corinthians 1, 8, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, again, the scriptures promote wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It is religion, the subtlest form of intellectualism that fosters ignorance. <laughs> Some 4,200 years ago, Noah's descendants defied the Lord God by gathering when he had commanded them to scatter. Genesis 9-1, Genesis 11-1-9. By introducing the world's languages as a form of judgment, the Lord delayed the nations from cooperating to build a city, political center, and a tower, religious center, in Babylon, near modern Baghdad, Iraq. These one-world monuments will ultimately be erected to man's glory in the ages to come when the Antichrist appears. Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Human civilization has been leading up or downgrading to that dismal point ever since the Tower of Babel. Romans 1, 18 and 32 explains the origin of our horrific global society. You read Acts 14, 15 and 17. God suffered the nations to walk in their own ways. Acts 17, 16 to 31. God let the nations walk in their ignorance, groping about. There are the Athenians, the Greeks, the lovers of the wisdom of men. The Gentiles of Ephesians 2. Romans 1.18. Romans 1.18. Back to Romans. Corinthians. Romans 1.18. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without, 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 without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they had a chance to know him. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. There's their chief sin, ingratitude. We couldn't care less about the Creator. He means nothing to us. Knowing Him means nothing to us. We want to know everything else, though. See? 21, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. He gave them over to what they wanted. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See? 28, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Look at that, look at that, look at that. God gave them up. 24, God gave them up. 26, God gave them over. 28, oh, there's this present evil world. Why is there crime, sickness, and suffering, and evil? Romans 1, Genesis 3, thanks Adam, Romans 5. Like the nations at Babel, those souls today seeking knowledge and wisdom and understanding apart from the one true God are but fools. Following the scientific method, we hypothesize, form temporary explanations concerning the operation of natural events. We observe those phenomena through experimentation, and we record our findings, data, data, thereby allowing us to refine or discard our prior description, ever striving to describe how it works. Nevertheless, if we do not look at God's creation through the lens of Holy Scripture, the eyes of faith, we will never see why it works. And that is true ignorance. Moreover, without the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us, we will have no prospect of ever attaining genuine knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16. Back to 1 Corinthians. We'll study this in an upcoming lesson. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep, things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Again, Christianity is the opposite, the opposite of ignorance. 1 Timothy 6, we're going a little long, I know, not too much longer. Thank you for your patience. 1 Timothy 6, 19. 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. In Greek, science is gnosis, gnosis, as in diagnosis, prognosis, okay? it's translated knowledge, some 28 times in our King James Bible. Luke 1, 77, Romans 2, 20, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Ephesians 3, 19, 2 Peter 1, 6, 2 Peter 3, 18, and so on. Observe how there are oppositions of science, falsely so-called. False teachers fight against sound Bible doctrine by promoting information that is wrongly titled science, as in knowledge. In other words, it looks like it profits its hearers and adherents, but it is as advantageous to the Christian, or even lost person, as fool's gold is to the prospector. What appears to be substance is but shadow. What seems to be treasure is merely trinket. Yet the undiscerning mind is none the wiser. Usually what is advertised as knowledge turns out to be nothing more than pointlessness. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2.9 again. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If we desire to ascertain God's words and will, we do not appeal to the eye, scientific method, empiricism, the ear, church tradition, second-hand data, data, or the heart, soul-searching intuition. Moreover, if we do not have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God to teach us, we have no hope of ever obtaining God's wisdom. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We can gain all the knowledge we want by attending every world institution of higher learning. Hmm. Yet this is but child's play when we survey the wealth of divine wisdom contained in the Holy Scriptures rightly divided. Summary and conclusion. Whew. Bible haters can methodically prove complex mathematical theorems, wisely dissect and repair human bodies, diligently translate ancient manuscripts, scrupulously draft elaborate blueprints for a mega-tall building, tirelessly endeavor to be a pioneer researcher in nuclear physics, boldly explore the mysteries of outer space, doggedly acquire a brilliant legal mind to obtain a political office, prudently develop budgets for entire nations, creatively sculpt incredible works of art, carefully investigate the ocean depths, and regularly compose technical articles for publication in scholarly journals. As educated, admired, and outstanding as these souls are, until they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thereby receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, true wisdom will forever elude them. The knowledge of eternal worth is a foreign language to them. Certainly they struggle to fathom even the simplest sentences in a sixth grade English Bible. The King James Bible. While the human brain is remarkable, it has a creator or mind superior even to it. And never forget that. There is the divine mind what Almighty God possesses, who gave us the ability to think and comprehend these very thoughts. Why does the natural world exist? Only when we read his book 
do we understand and appreciate the real meaning and purpose to what we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste. However, if we are content with just the how, we will go no further than natural explanations and natural reasoning, thus overlooking what matters most. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16. First Corinthians 1, 19 to 21 again. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And now we move along to chapter 2. Thank you, Father God. In Christ's name, Amen.